morning. Welcome to worship this morning. A few announcements before we begin. Just want to let you know that we have a new um, Synod Bishop. His name is Steve Delzer, and I think he will serve our, um, our Southeast Minnesota Synod very well. So be, be praying for him. It's a big um, undertaking that whoever becomes bishop has. Um, I would also like, like to thank Jeanette Grosskreutz, Shirley Lesto, and uh, Lorene Stern, who joined me as we went to the uh, Synod Assembly the, at the end of this last week. It was an, an, a wonderful undertaking. It was a, a good experience. And we were especially blessed by being able to hear from um, our synod or our national bishop. Um, and so we were glad that we could be with Mark Hansen. He's an excellent speaker. Um, I would like to also um, encourage you that in the future, that if you have any opportunities to ever go to any synod assembly, take it. It's a wonderful experience. You learn a lot about our church that we don't ordinarily hear in our local church. And so um, if you are ever given that opportunity, please say, say sure, I would be glad to do that. Um, a few other announcements. Um, just want to let you know that summer brings many opportunities for us. Um, what are the types of things that you like to do in summertime? Anybody have favorite things they like to do in summertime? Yeah. Camping, okay. Um, cooking over the fire, um, doing all kinds of things and enjoying family and friends. There are also many events, um, picnics that we have. Um, we will um, be having things that come, come pretty soon and, um, and we look forward to those opportunities every year. We're lucky we even have church today. I took Pastor Kathy's notes thinking they were from last week and stuck them in my folder there. And she said, I think those are my notes for today. <clears throat> I do have one additional announcement regarding this year's church auction. Arnie Carlson and his committee in their infinite wisdom came up with this idea of selling ads to promote this year's auction. Each of the following three people paid $100 for this ad that I'm going to be doing. Oh, I'm getting a text from Arnie. Oh, uh, I guess I put the decimal point in the wrong place. It's $1. They're, they're paying $1. Anyway, this year's church auction is brought to you by the following sponsors. Linda's Luscious Pies. She's offering one pie per season. Now, if you want to close your eyes and pretend you're listening to a radio ad, I have the perfect face for radio. <laughs> Nothing says spring like a fresh rhubarb pie encased in a homemade crust. And summer is peachy with a pleasurable Alberta peach pie. Fall's offering is an appealing apple pie with a touch of cinnamon. And my personal favorite is pumpkin pie in the winter with either a little ice cream or a little Cool Whip. Come to the auction and outbid Gerald and Maynard for a pie of season. <laughs> Our second ad for a hundred, no, one dollar. Dunking Dave Jacobson is putting up for bid not one, but two tickets to see the Minnesota basketball gophers coached by their new coach, Rich, Richard Patino. Be among the first to see live and in person Richard Patino's Minnesota gophers in the barn. And our third sponsor is Santa Sandy Hartman, who is not going to offer any lefsa this year not even, yeah, I didn't, she, she's done 10 dozen. She wasn't going to do any, but good old Arnie, sweet, talked her into one dozen lefsa for the auction. 
Only one dozen. So be there to up that bed to get this delectable Christmas treat. Now to the heart of the matter. This year's church auction will be held in the climate-controlled social hall. Tuesday, June 18th, mark your calendar, that's nine days from now, five o'clock, food will be served. The auctioneers will be the always entertaining Karen and Dwayne Bergman. Be there, bid there, eat there, laugh there, support the food shelf and admissions. Brought to you by our three wonderful sponsors. Please rise for the uh, gathering song. Oh, for, oh, this must be a typo. It says a thousand. I think we're a little short, so sing loudly. Over a thousand tongues to sing. ELW 886. to the front of your ELW and to page 94. We will be using the confession and forgiveness in the right-hand columns. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all of our sin and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now silently confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. 
Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The greeting, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Kyrie is printed in your bulletin. Let's join together for the prayer of the day. Compassionate God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to a new life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This morning's scripture will be read by Linda Hagen. First lesson is from 1 Kings <clears throat> chapter 17, verses 17 through 24. During a severe drought in Israel, God tells Elijah to find lodging with a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, west of Israel. The widow, despite experiencing severe hardship, offers hospitality to Elijah and is rewarded with a miraculous abundance of food. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, 
Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as well as he and her household, ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. The second lesson is from Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. The apostle and church planter, Paul, tells the church story of his ministry given to him by Jesus Christ in the midst of grave tension in his church in Galatia. He assures his congregation that his work is centered in the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, unlike the other teachers among them. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the Church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, The one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. 
As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. So when the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched her, the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorable on his people. The word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. There is death at the city gate weeping and wailing, both individuals and what they called professional mourners in those days, loud sounds of sadness and loss. Jesus was, Jesus was nearing Nain when he encounters this funeral procession. The body of some unnamed man is being carried out of the city so that the body of this man can be buried. The city, whose name actually meant beauty, wasn't really considered beautiful at all. The sights and the sounds of sadness captured the attention of its residents, who then caused them to think differently about what the future might be holding for them. You see, in Jesus' day, Death was considered unclean to devout and faithful Jews. All evidence of any death was quickly moved outside of the city limits. And at some times, people might see that as a good practice. But when we stop to think of how we in our cities and towns look at death, we don't even consider it unusual. Painful, yes, but not unusual. In many of our Midwestern cities we find cemeteries, in fact, right in the middle of the town. Perhaps you see them also in churchyards that are out in the countryside where you might travel. But one of the saddest sights for us to see is when we see grief. And Luke especially tends to point to this mother's loss. For generally, a widowed woman would be taken care of by her son. In those times, very few women were financially independent. And this woman was one such lady. And why? Why was she in that predicament? Because this woman has lost now her only son, perhaps her only child. Granted, she might have had some daughters, but in those days, daughters didn't count in terms of her prospect for long-term care. So her grief is accentuated by her economic worries. I think we have similar situations in today's world because of financial care of a single spouse who isn't quite sure how he or she is going to make it. So there is no doubt, no doubt that Luke is giving us so much information about this woman's family situation because he wants each one of us to know that not only is the widow's future 
happiness, and jeopardy, but her ability to survive is a real concern. Luke isn't going to go into too much detail to have Jesus express his sympathy and then just move on. No, this is not one of those setups for a drama situation. But what makes this different is that this woman's ability to survive financially is a real concern. It is a burden. From where we all stand in our lives today, we see, because of the information that Luke has already given us, that this woman's family situation is helpless. And what is the reason for Luke to be concerned? I think it could be because he wants us to know, without a doubt, that this woman's future happiness is in jeopardy. Her ability to survive is a real concern. As we might guess, Luke doesn't go into too much detail to have Jesus express his sympathy just to move on. The climax here is the restoration of the dead man's life. There can be countless ways to interpret the story by raising the dead. Some people will take this literally, while some will one wonder and pause to think, could it really be like this? Perhaps you might be one who appreciates science and questions, so you want to see and wonder, how can this really be? The people believed that Jesus truly raised the man from death. When God worked through Jesus, not only could the sick be healed, but even the dead could be raised. But I think that perhaps what's most important for us is that they were awed by God's power. And so they glorified God. A great prophet has come and risen among us, they exclaim. Yes, indeed. This prophet opened himself entirely up to God and told us that we could do the very same thing. And the word about Jesus and what he had done spread like wildfire throughout the town. That word continues to spread today. Despite our differences among us, we should be able to come to the same conclusion as did the citizens in Nain, as they embraced that man, helping him to rip away those burial bandages that were on him. They wept for joy with his mother, whose future has now been restored. A great prophet has risen among us. Let us glorify the God of life, the God of life who worked and continues to work through him. God regularly shows up where we don't even expect God to be. God never ceases to delight us and surprise us when we are so amazed. After all, Luke's original leaders hear this story 30 or 40 years after all of these events took place. But one thing that hadn't changed over the countless years is that Rome was still in charge, still occupying Israel. So thinking of all of this, I ponder how we can be so silly that to think in all of these situa situations, in the midst of all of these people, we think we have control. That's not the case, folks. It is God, through the Holy Spirit, who directs and leads us. It is God who is always there for us. God who does not disappoint us. And for that we say, Amen. Thank you, God.
Please turn to your ELW to Beautiful Savior, hymn number 838, as we sing. At this moment, I'd like to call Lorene Stern forward, and she'll give you a few ideas of what it is like to be at a synod assembly. Well, I have to admit, when I said I was going to do this, I thought, hmm, a lot of politics involved here. So before I got there, on my way over, I said a prayer to myself that the Holy Spirit would open up my mind and let this lear be a learning experience. And it was very, very good at learning experience. Let me explain a little bit about the Synod. The Synod is an assembly gathering of the members of the Southeastern Minnesota Synod ELCA, that's us. Some of whom have been granted the responsibility of being voted members to the members to the Synod Assembly. The Synod gathers for worship, which we did a lot of, and it was really neat because there was somebody from our our congregation right up there on stage singing. 
Katie Fick. She was a uh, part of the music uh, group that led us in music. And then we had some Bible study, some fellowship, and of course business of the synod, the budget, elections and resolutions, and reports. One thing I learned about this experience was you better be ready when you get there because you have a lot of materials to go through before you even get there. I did not do that, so I was not a very good representation of this congregation, but I will be next time, because I learned that you gotta read your stuff before you get there, because things go very quickly. When those resolutions come up, they go very quickly. You better be ready and how you wanna be voting. So, and another thing that impressed me was that everything was by Robert's rule and a very good plan parliamentary procedure, what you need when you got 509 people gathered together who want to vote. So that was another interesting thing. Another thing that, um, that I, I think experienced for me was getting a communion by Bishop Ushgard. Shirley told me that she gets real nervous when, that, when she gets to do that. And I got nervous too because I forgot to dip my bread in the wine. <laughs> It's like, oh, I did that wrong. Because I'm not used to that. We don't do that here very often. And so, yes, it is quite an honor to be uh, given communion by the bishop. And you know, what I experienced is also um, such great speakers, such great messages throughout the whole day. Lots of worship, lots of praise. And besides that, lots of business in, in put in the whole thing. Um, then I thought about, you should probably know, how do, we determine, how do we determine how many voting members do we get from this church? The number of voting members each congregation is eligible is based on 2011 baptized membership. That's how we're picked. And let's see what else I want to tell you. The contents of the whole meetings was, of course, preliminary agenda, reports, proposed budget, audited financial statements, nominations, and resolutions, which are very important because they are the hub, the center, the Senate is the hub of this ELCA. Um, I've seen a lot of fellowship. I've seen a lot of humor. And one of the best humorous things was when we were supposed to use our cell phones to call somebody during the assembly. And you were supposed to say, I have good news for you. Jesus loves you. So I picked up my phone and I thought, well, who can I call that might be home? So I called Jim. <laughs> and Shirley is sitting right beside me. And Jim finally answers me. I said, Jim, I have good news for you. Jesus loves you. And Shirley was sitting right by me, and she says, me too. And then I said, yeah, and Shirley loves you too. <laughs> Shirley was quite embarrassed about that. And Jim says, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> so you're on fellowship with lots of people and lots of good sense of humor. Oh, I learned that I am still such a baby when it comes to being a Christian. I have so much to learn. When you hear those speakers, you realize we have so much to learn. So I'm, and then, so you know, the Holy Spirit did answer my prayers. He did open my mind, and I did learn something. And you know what? I think I'll go next year. So thank you for for all your support and for the lovely rooms we got to stay in too. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. Maybe that'll encourage others to consider attending. At this time, would you please stand and we'll uh, say the Apostles' Creed in unison. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again.
he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time the ushers will tend to you as we give back a portion of what God has given us. If the VBS kids would come forward. Come on, Aiden. Hayden. Colt. Chloe. We had, um, by the middle of the week, we ended up with 30 kids at Bible school this year. And uh, we had seven adult helpers, and we had about 15 kids from fifth grade to through uh, eighth grade helping us in different positions. Uh, we had a good time. Our message was, I have my dog tag on, um, we camped out on mountains all week and we're in God's army and our dog tags were our little reminder. So we're going to sing for you, uh, Tell It on the Mountain. You may, receive, may remain seated for the offertory response, which is Awesome God in the Praise and Worship, page 11.
You may remain seated or kneel for the prayers of the church. Rejoicing in the good news of God, come near, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, we thank you for the many, day, many ways you lead us. Today we give thanks for the new future bishop of the Southeastern Minnesota Synod, Steve Delzer. At the same time, we give thanks for the blessing we have appreciated to the ministry of Harold Usgard, Guide him in his future. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all who are in our companion synods of Bogota, Colombia, and the central diocese in Tanzania, as well as our friends in Kinambeo, Lutheran. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks for the ministry of missionary Karen Anderson as she carries out your valuable ministry in Argentina. We also remember the Lofstroms in their daily work. Lord, in your mercy, watch over and guide all who walk in your paths, especially those in St. Paul Lutheran in Pine Island, St. John Lutheran in Wasika, Highland Prairie Lutheran in Peterson, and Peace Lutheran in Eora. We give you thanks for those who share their faith with others. Lord, in your mercy, we ask your blessing and safety for those who are in the service, including J.B. Wilner, Mike Kaufman, Jared Detloff, Josh Hansen, Danielle Hipper, Logan Maticola, Jared Billings, Brandon Ressler, Alex Raymaker, Kevin Stern, Mitch Meyer, Eric Trepto, Joshua Kaufman, Mike Maul, Keith Latterell, Ernie Quesada, Cole Wenzel, Lord, in your mercy. God of faithfulness, bless Christians everywhere with the courage and compassion to be your church, offering themselves to the world in unity and love. Give us eyes to see the earth as an expression of your love and teach us wisdom to live upon it with gentleness, care, and humility. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, we, play, we pray for the nations and all peoples of the world. Come with the mercy you have promised from of old. Help us to be this world's hope and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion, touch the lives of all who suffer now, especially Shannon Royce, Jan Helfritz, Stu Fullerton, Bill Niebuhr, Carolyn Tachi, Sue Henchy, Darla Horntash, and those we name silently in our hearts. Where there is despair, bring hope. Where there is illness, bring health. Where there is death, bring life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. God of ages, we thank you for the saints who have gone before us and lived out their lives of faithful witness. May we glimpse your steadfast love and follow in their footsteps. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O God of compassion, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. <clears throat> and at this time, take a few minutes to share the peace with neighbors and friends and maybe somebody that you haven't shook their hand for a while.
remain standing for God's benediction. The Lord blesses you and keeps you. The Lord's face shines on you and is gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and grants you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we sing our sending song, uh, just a reminder that coffee and confession, no, no, <laughs> coffee and conversation will be downstairs. The sending song is The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve, ELW 551.